This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back, and thanks for tuning in. Today we bring you part two of my conversation with University of Montana law professor Craig Cowie about a series of landmark decisions made during this year's Supreme Court session. These recent decisions are deregulatory in nature, so they, fa- they favor less regulation versus more regulation. Yeah. And I think they create a, an incredible amount of uncertainty. We'll pick it up with Craig's breakdown of the Chevron deference cases. Okay, we're back with Professor Craig Cowie. Craig, thanks for joining me again. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having me. Last week, we talked all about presidential immunity. This week, we're going to talk about the administrative state, maybe not quite as sexy a topic (laughs) off the bat, but one that maybe touches people's lives in ways more profound and important. First of all, what is the administrative state? When we say that word, like it doesn't sound very interesting, but why is it important? Why should we care? So when we talk about the administrative state, what we really mean is that Congress creates agencies that exist in the executive branch to cover certain specific subject matters. So we think about the environment, workplace safety, commerce, defense. These are all agencies. We have agencies for consumer protection and so forth. And what they do is they say, look, we've, as Congress, we've identified a problem. We want the air to be clean. Um, We want consumers to understand uh, the terms of a loan. And we're not sure what the exact best solution is. So we want to develop some expertise in the area. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask the agency to do that. We've identified the problem. We've given them direction on what we want them to do. But we recognize that uh, maybe we don't have the expertise to come up with a solution right now. And that's going to take some time. So then we ask these agencies to do it. And what they do is they can issue regulations that they can't conflict with the statutes, but they can sort of expand on them and maybe make it clear how they work. And then they can enforce the law. The process you're describing there seems like a grant of power from the legislative to the executive. Is that an appropriate way to interpret it? Yeah, at a high level, that is that is a, a fair way to think about it because it has to be cabined, right? So there's a thing called the non-delegation doctrine um, that you know prevents Congress from giving away too much of its power. But if, the, if Congress tells the executive what it wants done, but leaves the executive to fill in the details, that's okay. And of course, there are a bunch of mechanisms that allow Congress, if they don't like what the agency has done. Sure. They can strike a regulation. They can say, no, we don't want you regulating that way. Or they can just pass a new law that makes clear what they do want the agency to do. So that's within the checks and balances system exactly. as, we, as we know it. And so we have these agencies. They're designed to sort of be part of the executive and put rules to law, so yeah. to speak. The yeah, rulemaking they- process lives in these agencies. When it creates an agency, Congress can give the agency the authority to create regulations, okay. and it can give the agency authority to enforce the law. And if Congress doesn't give that power, the agency doesn't have it. But this is a way for you know Congress to say, well, we recognize that the situation might be changing, and we want the agency to stay on top of those changes and adjust the regulations to account for those changing circumstances. And so Congress could tell the agency to do that. It sounds like there was a handful of cases that came before the court that kind of all roll up into a somewhat new regime when it comes to how agencies operate. There were four very important um, cases involving agencies. And that was a fifth very important case, but that went the agency's way. And what they really go to is restructuring the relationship between Congress, the executive, and the courts, just like we were talking about last week, but in this context with what agencies can do and like who gets to tell Congress what it can do, how specific it has to be, when can an agency fill in the gaps, those kinds of questions. And so in that sense, they all fit together in a way that I think makes it more uncertain as to what is going to be lawful, what agencies can do. And I think that's the overarching impact. That, and as as we talked about last week, a shift of power to the courts. And that's what actually creates the uncertainty because now people, a court can say, no, that's not okay. And you're like, wait, 
I didn't expect that. And businesses don't like that. They'd like to be able to understand, you know, what's the playing field look like. Okay. So let's maybe break down yeah. one of these to a certain extent. Like, you know, like there was a case about offshore fishing rights and like how does some sort of dispute about fishing rights all of a sudden work its way up to the Supreme Court and have profound implications for how our system of governance operates? Yeah. So that's Loper Bright, which is the case that got rid of Chevron deference. In Chevron, what happened was there's a statute that's asking the agency to do something. We like to think that statutes or anything we write can be as unambiguous as possible. Mm. And there is a dispute amongst lawyers about, you know, whether it's you know possible to always be unambiguous or whether there's just going to be some ambiguity. If Congress is clear, then the agency has to do what Congress has said. And but the question is what happens when maybe Congress wasn't so clear or maybe Congress wanted to allow the agency to determine the the proper result because the Congress wasn't sure what the right answer should be. So in both those cases, they can create sort of an ambiguity. Prior to Chevron, the courts had a bunch of doctrines that would they would use to try and determine whether or not an agency had acted properly in interpreting a statute. So when when Chevron happens, it was generally seen as a deregulatory move because Chevron itself was a situation where people thought some people, and like particularly then Justice Scalia, right, who was a big proponent of Chevron deference, he believed, and others agreed with him, that judges uh, were sometimes substituting their policy judgments for Congresses mm. or, or for the executives yep. in the agency, and that that wasn't proper, that they should stick really just to the law. And so the Chevron framework was designed to try to cabin the court's role in this process. And what it said was, if the, if the statute is unambiguous, the agency has to follow it. If the statute is a- ambiguous, then courts are going to defer to a reasonable interpretation by the agency that's directed with implementing the statute. Hence the deference. Exactly. Okay. So that's the deference. And... So what happens in in Loper Bright is this comes up is basically people are saying that uh, th- you know this law is affecting me this regulation and and I don't I don't think it's right and so I want to challenge it and so the question was below the court said well we're deferring under Chevron deference we're going to sure. defer yep. to the agency's interpretation what the court did in Loper Bright is said no we actually can't defer we have to make that judgment. Now we can give what the court called due respect to the agency's findings, but it's our job as courts to say what the law was. And the reason this is important is there are a lot of these questions and you look at it. And again, this becomes an issue of framing, just like we talked about last week is that, is this a legal question, which is what Chevron was designed to handle legal questions. And under the doctrine, because you're deferring to the agency, if it was a reasonable interpretation Whether or not it's a legal question or a fact question didn't matter so much because fact questions also get deference. And now, if you frame this up as a legal question, there's no deference to the agency. Mm -hmm. But if it's a fact question or a policy question, that is something you're still supposed to uphold the agency's determination as long as it wasn't the phrase is arbitrary and capricious. So that's a pretty high standard for a court to overturn. But on the legal questions, there's no deference at all. So the court can substitute its own judgment. And so what is the basis for the court to overturn this? It's precedent, right? The court said that Chevron deference was actually prohibited by a law called the Administrative Procedures Act, which has been around since the 1940s. So they argued that that prior decision was incorrect on the law? That's right. And so that they were fixing that error because Congress had not given, had not directed the courts to defer to the agency in that statute. Interestingly, that turns out to be important because three of the justices believe that as a constitutional matter, uh, Congress can't delegate this authority in quite this way to an agency. And so what Chief Justice Roberts authored the majority, what what he said uh, was that, yeah, they could, but they didn't. And so one thing that comes out of the case is that Congress could theoretically, 
just pass a law that says we actually want you to put Chevron deference back mm. as a structure and at least under the majority's the language of the opinion if it did that the courts would then defer to Congress just like they did before so in, in this prior regime if we had a scenario where there's ambiguity the agency would sort it out now the courts have said nope it's up to the courts to sort out this ambiguity why does that matter to the average citizen why do we care one of the examples the dissent raises in this case is, so Congress has uh, stated that you have to protect uh, distinct populations of species, you know, as part of an act. And so then the question is, what does distinct mean? So under Chevron, was distinct like a legal question? Like, was that a legal definition for like population? Or was that a fact question, like a policy question based on the data? So the agency says, this is how we're gonna define population. And you're like, okay, that seems reasonable. We're good. Now, if that question of distinct is a legal question, then the judges are going to decide that. And if it's a policy question, we're going to still defer to the agency on were they being arbitrary and capricious. So that creates the opportunity for the court, if the court frames it as a legal issue. And I think this is where all the fighting is going to be uh, on this post uh, Loper Bright is that we're going to have people trying to frame things who who want the regulation to be stricken or they want agency's interpretation to be changed. They're going to say, no, it's a legal question. And if it is a legal question, then there's no deference and the court will analyze that according to, you know, legal interpretation. But one, of the, one raises the question of like, okay, who should decide whether or not a population is distinct? Is that, a, is that a legal question that we want the court to decide? The court's going to tell us what the answer is, like depending on how it gets framed up. The funny thing is this goes all the way back to Chevron itself. Like Chevron itself was a dispute about what counted as a stationary source for pollution regulations. And the Reagan administration's EPA, which at the time was headed by Justice Gorsuch's mother. Interesting fact. Yeah. Said, bit. you know, they changed their interpretation. And they said, no, the interpretation is, is this. And in that case, there were two reasonable interpretations, at least. One was more business friendly, leaned towards favoring economic growth. One leaned towards maybe protecting the environment. The question is who decides which of those interpretations is right? Do we want to rely on our agencies or Congress to tell us that, or are we going to rely on judges? So I'm trying to make sense of like, you know, what seems most consistent with my lay understanding of the constitution, like this power to make a determination as to, you know, what something amb that's ambiguous means. Should that be with a court? Should that be with an agency? Uh, yeah, I don't know really how to make sense of how to feel about this decision. What's interesting here is that they didn't decide this on a constitutional ground. They didn't say Congress couldn't do this. They just sort of said Congress didn't do this. And so in that sense, you could argue courts had the power to do it. They were sort of saying, well, Congress could have passed a statute that, that told us to defer. They didn't. Um, and so we're, we're not going to defer. But that sort of is in conflict with this concept called stare decisis, which is this idea that you, you don't change well-established precedents sure. for that reason. And of course, in this case, Chevron's been around, you know, as a doctrine, been around for about 40 years. And like I said before, philosophically, one of the reasons like Justice Scalia was such a huge proponent of Chevron and the reason Chevron was passed was because there was a concern under the doctrines that existed prior to Chevron that when judges made these legal rulings, what they were really doing was substituting their policy judgments for Congress's or for the executives. Sure. And, Which would be inappropriate because judges are not supposed to create policy. Right. And that's why to put it in a way that Justice Scalia might, you know, that's that the old doctrines were kind of loosey goosey. Yeah. Right. And and they were manipulable. And so he liked the Chevron framework because it made very clear who got to decide those questions. And it made it harder, he thought, I think, and I think a lot of people agreed, for judges to substitute their policy preferences for the policy preferences of the executive yeah. or Congress. And when we talk about due respect, which is the phrase the court uses in Loper Bright, the court does 
you know, say, well, we have to give respect to the agency's expertise and stuff like that. That sounds an awful lot like the types of deference, the doctrines that were in existence prior to Chevron. And so- So back to loosey-goosey? Exactly. So that's yeah. the concern. Now, there are some people who argue that Chevron was never very effective at policing that because there was a lot of discretion in deciding was there ambiguity or not. And people argued that judges occasionally would substitute their determination about whether or not something was ambiguous yeah. or whether or not the agency was being reasonable would be influenced by whether or not they agreed with the result the agency had reached. Sure. But that being said, Chevron had been cited in 18,000 cases wow. <laughs> prior so this comes to, up a lot. It was very well established as, as a way of sort of handling who gets to decide these questions, that sort of division of powers between the branches. And Loper Bright, um, by jettisoning that, returns us to an era where we're not exactly sure. We're probably going to get a lot of fighting in the lower courts about that. We'll be back to my conversation with Craig Cowie after this short break. A New Angle is proudly presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. This show does not happen without these pillars of our community, and I'm so grateful for their support and encouragement. And speaking of support, have you checked out our new website yet? Anewanglepodcast.com. There you can support our show directly with a variety of subscription options. Subscribers get access to bonus episodes, additional segments, writings, and other benefits. So check it out at anewanglepodcast.com. Hey, this is Ryan Tutel of ESPN Radio in Missoula, and you're listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with law professor Craig Cowie about the Supreme Court's decision on the administrative state. Fighting creates uncertainty, especially if we don't fully know, you know how the courts are going to handle anything. And with two very different standards of review, depending on how the court frames the question, some businesses are certainly going to be rightly concerned about like, well, how do I comply with the law? Or, And this is related to one of the other cases. So there was another case called Corner Post that I think we should talk about, which was just about how long do you have to challenge a regulation that's issued by an agency. For okay. most of the circuits, the lower courts that had considered this question, they all said that if you're just going to challenge the regulation, so you're not being prosecuted for a violation of the regulation, you're just challenging the regulation as being sort of wrong on its face. We call that a facial challenge. You have six years from when the regulation issues, basically. And what the court said in Corner Post is no, you have six years from when you first become subject to the regulation. The case was brought 10 years after, and the court said, no, you, you can't do that. So they then, the lower court did. And so they amended their complaint and they added some relatively new entities who had not been around for 10 years and who are now subject to the regulation. And then they challenged the regulation on its face, and again, not being prosecuted, and the court said, yes, they can challenge it. And so as a result, the court basically removed the statute of limitations yeah. on challenging established regulations. Corner post allows a new challenge. So if you can find a new entity, an entity that didn't exist maybe back when those cases were brought, hasn't existed for six years yet, and it then challenges that regulation, and you get... Theoretically, if you choose a different court, you know, that hasn't already ruled on the issue, that court could reach a different conclusion. So the scenario you're describing there is the first thing in this administrative state series of cases that I've heard that comes across as clearly pro-business. Is that a reasonable interpretation? I think not, actually. Oh, okay. So in, now at the time, you know, the Chamber of Commerce and other trade associations were very, they, they loved these decisions that viewed them as wins for businesses. But when I represented businesses in private practice, um, what, what I learned was that businesses often value certainty. Yeah, that and, is true. And if there is a regulatory framework that, you know, you may not like the regulation and you may think it's an overreach. But you know the rules of the game. But, and you know they apply to everyone equally. Yeah. So then you might invest in compliance. And, and 
what what I always thought when I when I acted as a government regulator, I want businesses to know how they can comply with the law. So that in other words, that when you find somebody not complying, it's not because they didn't know what they should do. It's because they weren't trying to comply mm. with the law, right? When regulations get issued, they often get challenged immediately. And that'll take a few years to resolve, and you'll get a court ruling that says yes or no. Once you've got yes, and once you got past that six years, you know, for decades, those regulations would then be in place. Now, the possibility of a new facial challenge never goes away. Yeah. So if you're a business that's trying to comply with the law and also not be put at a competitive disadvantage, how do you comply with the law knowing that somebody might challenge the law, mm. somebody might not comply, and then they bring a challenge and they win and now you've wasted all these resources. Yeah, it creates all sorts of new strategic questions for a business. Right, and make it harder for a business to just say, I want a level playing field where all my competitors have to follow the law. And, I, and I'll follow the law too. And we all know what the law is. And as a result, you know, we're just going to get a lot of uncertainty. So, and I've heard other people who represent businesses say that, say that they also are worried about this, that like, you know, certainty is worth a certain amount of money yeah, to a business. Absolutely. And what we have now is a whole lot, more than anything else, a whole lot of uncertainty and also a whole drag on how long and how effective we are at facing developing problems. Mm -hmm. You know, there's also a loss of expertise in this case because we're switching from relying on sort of subject matter experts in the executive um, who've taken the time and, and have the ability to like really delve into these issues. And we're transferring some of those decisions to judges who don't have that. They have expertise in laws, not that, but also a lack of political accountability because these judges, you know, once you're appointed and confirmed, you're judge, you're federal judge for life. We described two sort of genre of cases, the presidential immunity case last week, and then these administrative cases this week. You might view those as sort of in opposition. One seems to grant power to the executive and the other seems to be taking it away. You've made the case that both sets of cases accrue power to the ju judiciary. How are we supposed to make sense of what the project of this particular court is in, situated in history? These recent decisions are deregulatory in nature, so they, fa they favor less regulation versus more regulation. Okay. And I think they create a an incredible amount of uncertainty because so many of these decisions are getting transferred to the judiciary. So in the major questions doctrine that we talked about, you know, a while back, mm -hmm. um, the the court tells Congress you weren't specific enough in what you did, and you need to redo it. Here, under Chevron deference, same thing. You say, no, you made the wrong interpretation of this legal question, so you have to fix it or you can't do it. And all of these things, I think, both make it harder for our government to react and solve problems that are developing because they just make everything take longer. As a result of taking longer, they also create a whole lot of uncertainty in that period in which you're trying to figure out about what the law is going to be. Because the take longer means it has to go through courts. Right. Yeah, right. it has to go through courts. And also, it's it's going to, you know, if a court's going to say, no, you have to do it again. There was yeah. a case here that I think this term that actually is a great example of this, which was the Ohio v. EPA case. And... On the one hand, it was just a standard review of a regulation issued by the EPA under the Administrative Procedures Act. When you look at that case in the context of all these other cases, what you have is the court looks at how the agency engaged in that rulemaking and said, you did it wrong. You have to do it again. And that's the court's province. But also the more decisions that the court accrues to itself – the more often that can happen, the longer the process will take yeah. as we just try to yeah. iteratively work out like what is going to be acceptable. In other words, how does Congress know how specific it has to be to survive a court review? In the Ohio v. EPA case, the court um, castigates the EPA for not considering some things that happened, but 
the dissent argues in that case, they're like, look, the agency in the in the structure of review, the agency literally couldn't consider those questions. And so, but the court has said it must. And so again, substituting its judgment for, in this case, the executives, then creates this uncertainty as to how how we move forward and knowing what's going to survive scrutiny and what won't. Yeah. You're describing, you frame these as deregulatory in their nature. You might think that, you know, we often argue that getting rid of regulation allows things to move faster, but you're arguing that the opposite is likely to happen, that things will slow down and get gummed up. There's a lot of uncertainty and has to go through courts. Yeah. Because, and when you think about it, yeah, regulations certainly can slow things down. They can add cost. Those are all, that's all true. But we also want, a legal framework that allows our businesses to thrive. Sure. And if we don't have that framework, you know, uh, like everybody talks about the free market. Well, the free market exists because the government created it and protects it with a whole bunch of laws and rules and allows you to bring certain claims and all that kind of stuff. And that's all, I guess I'd call it infrastructure. When the cases are threatening the infrastructure, then nobody can be sure because – you don't want to build a building sure. unless you know the foundation is going to be secure. Yeah. And if, if the foundation is shifting, you know, maybe you hold off, maybe you wait, or maybe you proceed and then you suffer the consequences of when the regulations are found invalid or whatever, and you've invested in complying and now that's, you know, wasted. Now, do you think the justices have a conception of the of the of these trade-offs that you're describing, the sort of uncertainty that this will create in our operating rhythms? You don't see a lot of discussion about that in the cases themselves. You do see a lot, lots of comment, uh, commenters, oh, yeah. you know, businesses, lawyers, academics, all that will comment and they'll make points and they'll say, yes, it's going to be uncertain or they might disagree. But you don't see that coming up in the text all that much. So I don't know. What we're hearing across these two episodes is that more power is accruing to the judiciary. There's more uncertainty in general in the system. Seems like a boon for lawyers and law schools. Well, yeah, I think I think there is that that is the upside from a litigation perspective yeah. is that there's going to be a lot of fighting, um, and you know that that can be good for lawyers, but. Uh, the question is whether or not it's good for society. And I I think that question is open and we'll have to see how these cases develop. The one thing I feel very comfortable saying is there will be a lot of fighting yeah. over these cases and what they mean and how they are interpreted in the long run. And so it may be years before we fully see, but in the meantime, you know, all that uncertainty has an effect on existing businesses. Indeed. And it's great to have you in the mix to help us uh, understand it. So, Craig, thanks for joining me and thanks for helping us sort all this out. No, thanks for having me, Justin. Anytime. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. If you like what we do and want to support us directly, please consider a subscription at anewanglepodcast.com. A New Angle is recorded at Studio 49, a generous gift from UM alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. Our presenting sponsors are First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Kelly Larson is our producer. Maddie Jordan is our production assistant. VTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks made our music. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time. <laughs>